So far in this series, we have only used draw arrays to paint to our canvas. It's the simplest and arguably the most generally useful function for this, but it's actually only the first of five functions for drawing to the canvas. So in this video, we'll look at the next function on this list, draw elements. We'll look at what we need to get started. We'll get our first opportunity to talk about what targets are and we'll look at some of the limitations that you have to know about before you start using draw elements. Before we get going, let's look at one of the reasons we might want a function like draw elements. I'm going to create a short application that draws a pentagon to the canvas. The shaders are simple enough. The vertex shader simply sets the vertex position and it takes in a color value and forwards it to the fragment shader. And the program creation code here is taken straight from our Hello World example in our first video. For the code we're about to write, I've prepared some vertex data already. It describes the vertices needed for five triangles in the shape of a pentagon. We'll create a buffer, bind it to the vertex array buffer, and copy in our data. And I'll use vertex attribute pointer to tell WebGL about our position data. For now, this is made up entirely of x and y coordinates and nothing else. So stride and offset can be zero. I'm just going to set a static attribute value for the color for now. We'll enable our position attribute and draw our triangles in the shape of a pentagon. Let's take a look at our data again. Notice anything redundant or possibly redundant? Well, we're using the same vertex position 0, 0, 5 times here. And if you look even more closely, you'll see that all of the other vertex positions are repeated twice each. So there's a lot of duplication going on here. Draw Elements is intended for exactly the situation. Instead of specifying every vertex for every primitive, it lets you specify an array of all of the unique vertices in your mesh, along with an array of index values you can use instead to construct that same mesh. So let's try this out. First, let's extract all of the unique vertex positions from our original array. Next, using index values, we'll recreate each of the five triangles. The first triangle, for example, is made up of the first, second, and third set of vertices, so index 0, 1, and 2. Now it's time for the buffers. For our unique vertex data, we'll create a buffer, bind it to array buffer, and send in our data. But let's pause here for a second. Now, I didn't delete our old buffer. The buffer is still there, and the data we copied to it is still there too. But I know that this old data won't cause trouble for us. That's because when we called bind buffer a second time, it basically disconnected the old buffer. It let the new buffer take its place on the array buffer target. So think about this. We need to tell WebGL about our vertex data. We've done that. But we also need to tell WebGL about our index data. How do we do that without ejecting our new vertex buffer like we did to the old one? We can't use array buffer, so we need another target. And WebGL provides one just for index data, and this one is called element array buffer. This whole subject of targets can be incredibly confusing, so my next video will be all about objects and targets, and I'll go into this in much more detail. But for now, what I think you need to know is this. Buffers are very generic things. They don't do much more than allocate memory. But buffers can be bound to one of these several targets. These targets expand the things a buffer can do. They permit certain behaviors, and they enable certain functions. What do I mean when I say permit certain behaviors? Well, when calling draw arrays, buffers bound to the array buffer have the behavior of stepping through the vertex data in fixed chunks of interleaving position data, color data, texture data, and so on. It steps through vertex by vertex according to how we called vertex attribute pointer. 
element array buffer, on the other hand, has the behavior of stepping through index values, integers, simply one at a time, vertex by vertex. It also unlocks the function draw elements itself. This is important. It's one of these annoying WebGL functions that will throw an error when a certain object isn't bound to a certain target, and if you call draw elements, you'll throw an error if a buffer isn't bound to the element array buffer target. Anyway, more on this in the next video. So let's keep going. We'll create a new buffer for our index data. We'll bind it to element array buffer and send it our index data. And finally, call draw elements. We're drawing triangles. Let's start with just three vertices. Because we're using a uint8 array, the data type is unsigned byte, and we're starting from the first index. So what did that get us? Well, the data we created for our original draw arrays example at the start of this video took up 120 bytes. Using draw elements, we're down to 48 bytes for the vertices and 15 bytes for the index data. So we're using about half as much memory. The downside is that with the extra buffer, there are more round trips to the GPU. So it's good, but it's not mind blowing. But there's an even bigger downside that you have to consider before choosing draw elements. Let's go back to our original example and add color data. We want each of the five triangles within the pentagon to have its own color. So that works, but it was pretty brutal. We double the number of bytes in our vertex buffer, but we have our five distinct colors. Now let's try to do the same thing with our elements array. Okay, that's definitely not what we wanted, and this is the biggest drawback of using draw elements. The problem is that often a vertex isn't just its position information, it can contain information like color values or texture coordinates or normals, and so often there is no vertex information that can be shared. In these cases, draw elements makes things worse, not better. Here's a great example that demonstrates the trade-off we're talking about here. It's also one of my favorite meshes, the Icosphere. This one has just 42 vertices describing 80 faces. With smooth shading and from a distance, it makes a very convincing sphere. And as long as your data produces an Icosphere with a radius of one, a nice benefit is that you get normal values for free because the position values are identical to the normals. This is a fantastic case for using draw elements because it requires only about 400 bytes. But if you need normals for lighting, but don't want smooth shading, the data required to create this mesh in WebGL goes from 400 bytes to almost 6,000 bytes. It's a big step up, but there's really not any alternative. So yeah, if you're lucky and your data is simple and highly repetitive, this is a really nice way to cut down on that ocean of vertex bloat that you sometimes get. It's definitely a function that you want to use when you can.